Well, good morning, everybody. How are we this morning? Cool. Come on, come stand to your feet. So, so welcome to our visitors this morning. I haven't met you. My name's Jason. Welcome to all of those online too. Eventually sing louder with me. Right? Sing a little louder. 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 My weapon is a 
up to God. Lift it up. I'll raise up
just completely in your awe this morning. God, you are so good to us. You are so good to us in every season of our lives, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's challenging, whether it's amazing. God, you're there with us. So God, we just, we give you um, at the service this morning, God, we give you ourselves this morning um, as we spend time with you. Amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Why don't you have a quick seat? I'm Emma, if you haven't met me before, I'm one of the leaders here at Riverland Central Church. Good morning if you're on the live stream, we're really happy that you're able to join us and we have the opportunity to be able to have a live stream. How awesome is it that we're in a technical age that you don't actually have to be somewhere to actually encounter God and to be able to feel like you're part of a community. I think that's great. I'm going to give the church news right now. Oh dear. Are we back? We're not back. Let's try the yellow one. Yellow. Whoa. Okay. How are we all this morning? We good? Fabulous. All right. We're going to find out what's going on in our church this week. So, Kids Church is on today. Who's excited for Kids Church? Yes! So you're going to be going out in a minute when we do our meet and greet time. So when the music comes on and everybody gets up and starts talking, that's your cue to go out, watch for the leaders, and go around the side just to the my right over this side. Now, important, please don't go in through the gate, or, or through the doors. Just wait there for the leaders, okay? We don't want to be... Um, storming in there and potentially ruining any surprises or anything that the leaders might have ready for you. Who knows? I don't know. (laughs) Might not be. (laughs) But yeah, let's just wait outside and wait for the leaders. So what's on this week? Today at 12.30, we have the Women's Bible Study. So if you're interested in that, um, please hang around, 12.30. Uh, normally on Monday at 1pm there'd also be a women's Bible study but I'm assuming because of the public holiday they're probably not having one. Yes, so uh, that's not happening this week but uh, keep an eye out to see if it's happening next week. Wednesday 7.30 we have our Zoom prayer meeting. Everybody is welcome. If you haven't, if you're not on the list to get the text messages about the link, um, just text the church phone and that will get you on, yep, that will get you on the list. And then Friday at 7pm we have G1 Youth Connect Groups. So if you have any questions about that, or you know anybody who is youth age, see Emily Menadju. Just wave, Emily. Awesome. Fabulous. Very exciting. couple of weeks' time, we have Nick Resky coming up to uh, have a encounter weekend. So come ready to encounter the Holy Spirit. Come ready to encounter Jesus if you haven't encountered him before. Um, and uh, it's going to be great. So on Saturday, 7 p.m., it's like, that's on the 1st of July at 7 p.m., that's our night service. And then on the 2nd of July will be 10 o'clock like normal on the Sunday. And just a reminder, we have our um, little free pantry that's out under the veranda, which gets used frequently by people in our community. And we'd love it if you could um, just put a couple of items in your trolley if you want to give towards that um, and just let us know or you can put it straight in there. Up to you. But we need items that don't perish. So don't worry about fruits and vegetables. We want, you know, pasta, rice, breakfast cereals, tea, coffee, toiletries, that sort of stuff. So um, if you're interested in giving to that, that would be fantastic. And I'm going to head over to Joella now. Thanks, Emma. Welcome to Kids Church, everybody. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, aren't I? Because this is going to be the Kids Church room in a few months' time. Kids, this is going to be the Kids Church room in a few months' time when we can kick all the big people out. In the meantime, uh, Kids Church is happening down the, down the way a little bit and that'll be happening in just a minute. I just want to take an opportunity to say thank you to all the leaders, so the people who uh, lead in Kids Church, the people who, um, you know, who prepare and who set up and who get organised. And I want to say thank you to a nameless person who uh, sets up even before the Kids Church people arrive and often cleans up after them as well. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to mention who that might be, but I just want to say thank you to him as well. 
So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, just, the kids are so great. We have some fabulous kids in our church and we have a, we have a lot of fun. We play some games and we do all kinds of things. And um, we need you to pray for us because there's a whole pile of other kids out in the community who don't know about Jesus. And we would love to get to a point once we've moved into this space and we've got a bit more room when we can begin to invite other kids who've maybe never been to church before, other kids who've never heard about Jesus to come as well. And so I would love it if we, the church, would be praying for the kids, who, the ones who are here now and the ones who are coming. And so can we just pray together for the kids of our church? Why don't you jump to your feet? We're going to pray together. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you that we, uh, we, get to, we get to be with the children of our community. We get to have kids, some of us, and we get to, to enjoy other people's kids, the rest of us. And God, we just thank you for children. We thank you, Jesus, that you love them, that you called them to yourself. When other people would say, no, kids are not important, push them away, Jesus, you said, no, 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 let the kids come. And so, God, we want to say too, let the kids come. And Jesus, we ask that you would reveal yourself to children. You'd reveal yourself to kids who've never heard about you before. Lord God, that this would be a, a place where children of, of all kinds can come to know you, can come to experience your presence and uh, can begin to live a life for you. And so, Jesus, we, um, we thank you. We thank you for the people who lead our kids. We thank you for um, the the. The, the children themselves and we thank you God that you're calling them to yourself you're equipping them and and growing them and teaching them to love you and to love other people and so God we um, we just thank you and we ask that you would help us we pray that your spirit would move in the lives of the children and the old people as well but in the children specifically just now and um, God we ask your blessing on them in Jesus name amen. amen don't sit down in just a moment on the screen there'll be a three minute countdown you've got three minutes to say good day to a few people um, and the children if you're primary school aged it's time for you to come on out too and so just come on out the front door there if you're not sure where to go and we'll show you what to do Luke and I will be with you today so go on three minutes say hello to somebody shake a hand say welcome to church introduce yourself have a lovely time
All right, all you social butterflies. So when you finish pretending to be nice to each other, let's uh, go back to where we are. We're going to worship God together. And uh, as we do that, I'm just so thankful when I look around the room and I see people caring for each other, enjoying each other. You know, um, one of the characteristics of the church, Jesus' church, isn't how many Bible verses you know. It's not which gifts of the Spirit you have. It's, it's not your knowledge about God. Um, Jesus said that we would be known by our love for each other. So I'm just so thankful to see people enjoying each other and loving each other. Uh, that shows that we know Jesus. That shows that we know God. We're going to worship Him. And if um, you're someone who's part of the Riverland Central family, uh, now's a great opportunity to just tune into the Spirit and just ask, Holy Spirit, what would you like to say to our church, to our gathering this morning? And if you sense you've got a a message from God or a word from God that uh, may be for the church, come and have a talk to me in the next couple of songs and uh, we'll, we'll make a space for that. Why don't we just stand to our feet, whether that's physically or spiritually. Let's present ourselves before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's ask that the Holy Spirit would, uh, would rain down on us. Let's ask that His uh, blessing and His praises would rain down on us, even as our praise goes up to heaven like incense. Let's praise Him together. Yeah. 
children of God and he just loves us so much he surrounds us I sort of think you know to the to the footprints proverb of you look back and you go you know God why weren't you there for me because there's only one set of footprints well even when it's not going so well he's still there and maybe sometimes he's carrying us relationship with Christ that gets us through to God now it's not a say the sinner's prayer be done with it and you know go off and do your own thing because that's not quite how it works God calls us to follow him and to try and be more like him so we've still got some work to do on our part none of us are perfect I'm not perfect. No one is. Why not God? Why not Jesus? He was the only one who was perfect. But how cool is it that because we're children of God, we've got nothing left to fear. Death's been arrested for us. We get to spend eternity with Him. How cool is that? And if, if you're going through something tough right now and you are a child of God, rest on that. You are a child of God. Slaving to fear. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear.
Put your hands up to God. We pray in every nation. Holy Spirit, come down. Rise, be known. Our hope Touch and us. salvation. Christ just in this uh, vibe now where uh, it feels good, the Holy Spirit's moving. I just want to talk to anybody who kind of feels like there's a line and they're on the wrong side of it, you know, they're, they're standing on the outside looking in to quote an old band. Um, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, come to me everybody who's weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Notice he doesn't say, you know, if you've got the right personality or you grew up in the right family or you come from the right cultural group or you've got so much money. The criteria for coming to Jesus and being accepted by Jesus is if you're weary, if you're heavy laden, if you need Jesus, if you need Jesus. And that's all of us. You know, we all need Jesus. None of us are good enough to get through this life in our own strength. None of us are good enough to, um, to make it happen. We all need Jesus. And so if you're standing back and just thinking, well, that's good for them, but that's not, good for, that's not what I need. Well, that's not, that's not for me. We all need Jesus. Lord Jesus, as we stand before you, we all need you. Without you, God, we're spiritually bankrupt. Without you, we've really got almost nothing to bring to the table. And so, Jesus, I pray now that you would speak, be speaking by your Spirit to everybody in this room who, who stands back at a distance from you or stands back at a distance from, from the gathering, stands back at a distance from worship, going, what on earth is that all about? Just show them, Lord, that your doors are wide open for them. Show them... Lord, that uh, the invitation is there for them as well. Come to me, says Jesus, all of you who are weary, who carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Good to see everybody. Happy Sunday. Well, we're having communion this morning. Everybody's got something? Have you got communion, everyone? If you haven't got one, please uh, put your hand up uh, and they will pass it to you. And for those that are joining us through the live stream, please welcome and grab something for yourself as we share communion. Hallelujah. Amen. Now this morning I just wanted us to I just wanted to remind us or to remind myself that we are completely forgiven. Amen. Completely forgiven. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm married to a, a a drama teacher and she talks about drama every time. And um, so I was reading this book. It's actually a play and it's written by uh, William Shakespeare's. And this play, um, <laughs> it's funny because uh, uh, Lady Macbeth uh, was, a, uh, w was married to her husband and she always dreamed of him becoming the king. So she, one time she, she, she mysteriously got this vision that her husband is going to be the king. So she convinced him to try and be the king. So she tried and told, uh, she talked to him to kill the previous, like, the present king. So he succeeded and he killed him. But because he was so guilty, 
he was con condemned and he felt really bad. But she was so good that she covered up for him. She told him, I'll cover everything for you. So she covered up and he became the king. So they had everything that they wanted, but inside her, she was so remorseful. She felt the guilt. And over time, when he was crowned, she became so mad and so confused that she became mentally unstable that in the end, she ended up keeping washing her hands <laughs> and saying that, when are these hands going to be clean? But she was mentally unstable, so she didn't actually get to enjoy what she planted. But guilt is an emotional thing. You know, when you're guilty, when you feel something wrong in you, in some ways, it stops you from growing. It stops you from receiving from God. It stops you from being free. And you start to doubt yourself. But this morning, as we share communion, I just wanted to tell you that you're completely free. Amen. Nothing can stop you from accessing God. He's created you, and he paid the price. Just this week, in the news, we had about this lady who was freed from prison. She spent nearly 20 years in prison. But can you imagine the freedom she's feeling right now? Some people might be excited for her because there might be some compensations. But that's not the point. The point is the freedom we receive from Jesus. He paid one price, and that was all for all of us. We no longer have to go and pay sacrifices for anything. You know, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about the sacrifices. You know, in the past days, when you committed a sin, you had to give something. So you're always accountable to God because of your guilt. So because of that, men had to continuously give or sacrifice something. So we will all come to, to church like we have come today. And this is our pastor. So we'll bring something to sacrifice, to give thanks to God for what we've done or, you know, repent and do things like that. So we'll bring all our collections or I don't know what you want to bring. Let's say we bring something. I'll bring a cart, you bring a cow, you bring a sheep, somebody brings a dog. I don't know. What do you give to sacrifice? I don't know. You can bring something, but you had to bring something to pay for your sins. And then we'll bring it all in. We'll give it to the pastor and the pastor will slaughter and that is, so for that week. So because it was so continuous, man, we always sin. So we always have to come up with something. So every Sunday, <laughs> we'll be coming up with a big one. So maybe a big cow, and the pastor will slaughter that. And he has to do that for himself. But when God saw that, and he said, no, I have to rescue my children. I have to rescue my beloved. And when you read in Hebrews 10, 11 to 18, it tells you that you are chosen one. Yeah. You are the chosen that God himself paid the price. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for all of us. And we are completely forgiven right. in Jesus' name. So as we take communion this morning, I don't know what is bounding you. I don't know what guilt you feel. Well, I've done something wrong myself where I felt like I should really. And I'm not worthy. But you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how I'm dressed. It doesn't matter how I'm looking. I am completely forgiven. That's right. And that is for once and for all in Jesus' mighty name. So let's stand up and thank God. Just thank him really, you know. We are completely forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And this is the body that was given for our sins.
And he said, take this and share it. And this is my body that is given for you. So let's thank God and eat it. Thank you, Jesus. And also, the juice, that this is the blood of Jesus that washes and takes all our sins away. So we're so thankful for the sacrifice. Let's drink. Thank you, Jesus. Now we welcome Pastor Dave to come and preach. Well, thank you for that very kind welcome. <laughs> Thanks for all your applause. It's fantastic. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Hey, um, thanks so much, Lawrence. That was really good. It is so important that we remember um, that we are forgiven in Christ. Um, just mental note, please don't bring me any cats to sacrifice. Okay? Um, I'd have a cow. Cow would be okay, but no cats, all right? Um, quick, quick show of hands. Who are the cat people in the room? Yep. You know cats are the only domestic animal not written in the Bible, by the way. Uh, who are the dog people in the room? Yeah, I think the dog people have it today. Who, who doesn't care? Who just loves animals? <laughs> who hates animals? <laughs> okay, we know the, who the sociopaths are in the room. Great. Okay. Um, I want to give a special welcome to, um, to those of you who are on live stream as well this morning. Um, and I have a, some special guests in the, in the room today. And um, they are John and Cheryl Ford, who are our live stream leaders. So... Um, I just want to welcome John and Cheryl, and I want to show you who they are, because for a lot of you on live stream, these guys pastor you and they look after you week by week. Uh, John and Cheryl are grey nomads who uh, travel around Australia in their caravan, um, and every week they tune in on our live stream and they, um, they host it, they pray for people, they um, provide a great connecting space on our live stream. Um, this morning they met some people, I think, who have been part of our live stream congregation who they'd never met face-to-face -face before, which was really exciting. So I just want to celebrate these guys. I want to thank you so much for all you do for our live stream community, which is a significant part of our church. And um, let's just champion these guys and let's thank them for what they do. So now you know what they look like. I hope you still want to tune in. Okay. <laughs> Um, we are finalising our series on Revelation this morning. Uh, it's called Seven, Seven Churches of Revelation. Over seven-ish weeks, we've been going through um, uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. We've been looking at each of the seven churches of Revelation. We've been understanding that Jesus wrote a letter to each of these seven churches through the Apostle John, uh, wrote to wrote to John uh, a vision, sorry, gave a vision to John, and John then wrote down those letters and sent them out to these, these seven churches in Asia Minor. And we're drilling down into each of these letters, and we're trying to see what these letters mean for us in the, in the, in the modern day. Um, so let's have a look on the screen. We're going to see a map of uh, what is now modern-day Turkey, it was then called Asia Minor. And so we've, we've kind of done a bit of a road trip and we've gone round to each of these churches. We started with Ephesus uh, up there, uh, which we called the, the stale love church. They were the church that lost their first love for Christ. And, uh, and Jesus was telling them, hey, you need to, you need to come back to me. Then, then we looked at Smyrna up there. Smyrna was the suffering church. They were being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. And uh, Jesus was telling them, hold on to me. Hold on to me in the midst of your suffering. Then we looked at Pergamum. They were the compromising church. They were just trying to blend in with the culture around them, trying to uh, kind of be chameleon Christians who, who kind of just blended in with whatever was going on. Then Thyatira, they were the tolerating church. They were tolerating and they were actually even celebrating sin in the midst of the congregation, in the midst of the church. They were trying to live the, the, the truth that uh, you can be a Christian and you can live however you want. But of course, we know that that's not the truth. 
That is actually a lie. You can't just be a Christian and then just, okay, I, I love Jesus, but I'm just going to live however I want. And Jesus was, was pretty hard with them and he slapped them. And then there was Sardis, the sleeping church. And that was a church full of boring, sleepy Christians who Jesus was saying, wake up, come on, wake up, get with it. Let's get moving. And last week we looked at Philadelphia, the enduring church. Now, their world, of course, was crashing down all around them, physically in some cases, because they were, um, they were in an earthquake zone. Um, but Jesus, he told them to endure. He told them to hang on. Now, out of these six churches that we've seen so far, that we've, we've visited so far, only two of them got a good report from Jesus. Of these six churches, four of them, were get, they got hammered by Jesus. He, he gave them a kick up the pants and he said, come on. Let's get moving on this area or let's change that area. Only two of them got a good report. Today is city number seven, church number seven, and this is the church at Laodicea. Can you say that word? Laodicea. Laodicea. Doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, does it? Like Berry? Laodicea. Now, before I read the letter to the church at Laodicea, I'm going to give you four words, okay? And these four words are words that will help you to understand the cultural cues and the, the climate of the church at Laodicea. It'll, it'll help you to understand the city. It'll help you to understand what the city was known for. Because when Jesus, I, think, I hope you've discovered as we've been going through these, um, these churches there's a whole heap of cultural references that Jesus is kind of, he looks at the church and he says, I know you. I know the climate of your city. And, and there's all this sort of, um, it's not exactly code, but, but these cultural references that we need to understand if we're going to understand how these letters come together. So the city of Laodicea, it was known for four things. Now, the first of these things was health. First of these things was health. So if you're taking notes, you can write down health. And I've got this, um, this pill bottle here to help us just remember health. Okay, so the city of Laodicea was known for health. The archaeologists have uncovered a school of medicine in Laodicea. People came from all over the region to be treated uh, for different health conditions and particularly eye disease. So I guess they had these kind of early ophthalmologists there, you know. Um, they were treating eye disease, and Laodicea was actually known for uh, producing a particular salve that dealt with eye infection. So health, can you say that with me? Health. So that's the first thing Laodicea was known for. Um, the second thing Laodicea was known for was wealth. Okay, wealth. Laodicea was on the um, crossroads of several uh, significant trade routes. And so as a result, uh, the people of Laodicea had a lot of money. So they had a lot of wealth. And um, so, so when you think of um, Laodicea, think of it like a prosperous banking city. Okay, Think of it like Zurich. Maybe think of it like Monaco or, or maybe Cobdogla. I'm not sure, but it's a prosperous place. Okay, A lot of money there. So let's go. We have health. We have Wealth, look at you Bible scholars, so good. And the third, the, third, um, the third thing that Laodicea was known for was water. Okay, so health, wealth, and water. And the reason they were known for their water isn't because their water was good. They were actually known because they didn't have a viable source of drinking water. Uh, even though the city was on a river, the river was highly polluted, and so they had to actually pipe in all of their water uh, to the city. So um, the people of Naodicea, they had to pipe their water in from neighbouring cities. And we're going to see a photo on the screen now. Uh, if, you, if you went to Laodicea today, this is what you would take a photo of. Let's keep those, those slides moving along. Um, so cold water came in from Colossae in a, through a bunch of sort of uh, underground pipes. But then this uh, Roman aqueduct was built and it brought in hot water from these mineral springs uh, from a place called Hierapolis. So just like you have hot and cold water piped into your house, the city had hot and cold water piped in from a long way away. 
Um, and so they were known for having bad water, uh, but they had this water piped in. Okay, so we have health, we have wealth, we have water. And then the last thing that um, Laodicea was known for was wool. Can you say that with me? Wool. Wool. The, um, the people of Laodicea were, were renowned for having these black sheep uh, in, their, in the, in the uh, fields around the city, and they produced this really high-quality, silky black wool uh, from these sheep. And the people of influence, the people of wealth in the city, they'd be all dressed in this black woolen robes. Okay, So they were, they were, they were kind of like, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of you know, people from Unley, or something like that, where they're just you know, all dressed in black and they're looking amazing. Um, this is the sort of, that's what they were wearing, okay? So they wore this black wool all the time. Okay, so say that with me. We have health, wealth, water, and wool, all right? So that's, those are the four words that you need to understand and start to decode some of the cultural references that we're going to talk about as we... Um, read through Jesus' letter to the church at Laodicea. So if you have a Bible with you, you can open it to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, it will appear on the screen in the uh, New Living Translation as well. But uh, we're going to pick up the story or the letter. Actually, I should get it out, shouldn't I? So here's our letterbox with our seven letters to the churches. Laodicea. Let's see what Jesus is saying to the church at Laodicea. He says this. Write this letter to the angel of the church of, in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. Okay, let's pause there. Which of our four words does this relate to? Water. Oh, look at you guys. Fantastic. Yeah, it relates to water. The, remember, the Laodicean city, they piped in their water, both their hot and their cold water from other cities. Now, the problem was this. Um, the other cities that they piped their hot and cold water from were over eight kilometres away. So they didn't have electric pumps like we have today. Um, they didn't have um, uh, kind of insulated pipes. I mean, the aqueduct itself was open. By the time the water came from Laodicea, uh, to Laodicea from those other two cities, it wasn't hot or cold. It was lukewarm. Okay? It was tepid. And can you imagine, I mean, we, we live here in the Riverland, People understand the grind of our summers. You know what it's like to work out in the garden or in the shed on a hot summer's day when the, the sweat is just dripping off you and then you come inside and, and all you want is a cold glass of water. Can you imagine getting that cold glass of water and picking it up and you're about to drink it but it's not actually cold? It's that sort of tepid, you know, it's lukewarm, it's not... Mm. It just wouldn't be, it's not refreshing, is it? You know, if, if water's been sitting in a, um, in a canteen or in a water bottle all day and it's just, it's not hot, it's not, oh, it's, it's yuck, isn't it? When you, you know what I'm talking about when you do that? Yeah. And what about in the winter, like, you know, those cold winters mornings that the Riverland is known for? And we, um, you know, you, you've been outside, you've been for your walk in the morning, you've been for your run in the frost, and then you get home and you're just looking forward to that hot cup of coffee, you know, and you, 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 you make that hot cup, hot cup of coffee and you're ready to have it, but it's not hot. It's, 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 it's not even an iced coffee. It's just that middle of the road stuff. It's just yuck, isn't it? It's just yuck. It's just yuck. So cold water is refreshing on a hot day. Hot coffee warms you up on a cold day. But lukewarm water, it, it, it doesn't really do anything. It's, it's just nasty. So, so let's read on now, verse 16. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, 
I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, the translators here, they, they actually sugarcoat the words a bit. All right. Um, the Greek word here for spit you is the same word that we use, uh, the same, has the same root that we use for the word emit. So to actually emit something. Um, probably a better way to translate it would be the word vomit. Okay, the word spew, the word yak up. Um, chunda, chuck. That's the word we're going for here. Okay. So Jesus is saying, since you are like lukewarm water, I'm actually going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to drive the porcelain bus out of my mouth. That's what he's saying, okay? Now, I, before we get into this and before we expand on this, are there any, sim are there any sympathetic vomiters in the room? <laughs> is, is there anyone who, when someone else starts to vomit, you start to go as well? Oh, there is. Whoop. Okay, well, for you guys, you might want to look away right now. Or you might want to leave the room. Um, quick show of hands, those of you who've raised kids, who's cleaned up more vomit than you like to clean up? Okay. <laughs> yep, yep, okay. Who, who has not had vomity, who's had kids but they weren't vomity kids? Nobody, all right, we've all cleaned up some horrendous, you didn't have a vomity kid? God bless you, you are the most blessed man in the world. That's the one thing you learn about children, isn't it? You handle bodily fluids that you never in your wildest dreams thought you were going to handle before. It's crazy. All right. So um, I was trying to figure out how to bring the Bible to life here. I was trying to figure out how to, um, how to kind of show you what this word is about. And so the best thing I could come up with um, to bring the Bible to life, here's a video that is going to help us. And this is a video of 26 babies <laughs> vomiting in 60 seconds. <laughs> so here we go. Let's have the sound on. Oh, isn't it beautiful? It's a thing of majesty. Here we go. He's manifesting, I think. <laughs> Look away. Okay. All right, it's safe to return. Oh, one person's left the building. <laughs> if there's a puddle in the car park afterwards, we know what that's about. Oh. All jokes aside and all fun aside, it's pretty hard not to watch something like that and not have a visceral reaction. Who's, who's feeling a bit queasy now? Yeah. Who, who's kind of... I saw a few people sort of sitting there with their faces screwed up. Um, I mean, even if you laugh, the laugh is a defense mechanism against that kind of stuff, isn't it? Um, but I want to say what Jesus is saying to this church at Laodicea, this is probably the harshest, most graphic critique that he gives to any of the churches that we've looked at so far. Jesus is using gross language here, and he's using it deliberately. He's, um, he's saying, you know, when I see your church... When I see your faith, you make me want to spew. You, you make me want to vom. That's, that's what he's actually saying to these churches, to this church. He's saying, I want to spit you out of my mouth. You make me want to hurl. Incredibly graphic, incredibly damning. And Jesus is saying, I, I actually want my followers to be either hot for me or cold for me. Don't give me any of this lukewarm nonsense. 
Be, be hot, like be completely on fire, be completely in love with me and let your life be revolutionary, revolutionarily changed by me or be cold. Be completely uncommitted, but please don't give me any of that middle of the road nonsense because that makes me sick. That makes me sick. I mean, think about it. If we say Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my saviour, Jesus is the one who, who's my king. He rescued me from the fires of hell. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He paid the ultimate price for me. But my belief makes no difference in my day-to-day living. If I keep living half-heartedly for Jesus, then my faith is useless. And what my faith actually does is it doesn't show who Jesus really is to other people. That's the truth. Jesus would actually prefer that we were a committed atheist or a committed pagan rather than a half-hearted Christian because at least the committed atheist or the committed pagan takes their faith seriously. If we don't take our faith seriously, it makes Jesus want to bomb. That's what this is saying. Devastating. (laughs) You don't want to be getting this letter. You don't want to be getting this letter. So why was Jesus being so harsh towards the people of Laodicea? Why was he using such graphic, explicit language to say, well, actually, this middle-of-the-road stuff, this this lukewarm stuff, it makes me want to spew when I look at you. We'll, We'll actually see part of the answer if we read on now in verse 17. You say, he says, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you'll be rich. Then you'll be rich. So let's go back to our four words. What are we dealing with here? We're dealing with wealth. We're dealing with wealth. The reason that the Laodicean church was so lukewarm... It was because of their wealth. They were rich. They were really rich. In fact, they were so rich that they had every single thing that they needed. They didn't need a thing. Everything they wanted, they didn't need a thing. Um, In in fact, the the, the research or the, the, the archaeological research shows that they had an earthquake, a bit like the church did last week, and um, the Romans came to them and said, we want to help you rebuild after this. And they said, no, 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 we don't need you guys. We've got more than enough. We can rebuild by ourselves. They were loaded. I want to be really clear about something. Being rich is not a sin. Having money and having possessions is not a sin. That having those things by themselves is not evil. However, when we're wealthy, the danger is that our attitude changes. The danger is that we become self-sufficient and we say, I don't need anything. The truth is that our material blessings, and who knows, living here in Australia, one of the wealthiest countries in the world... We are all rich. We are all rich. If you're on Centrelink benefits, I think it's something like you're still in the top 86% of the world's wealth. Don't quote me on that. You'll have to look it up. But, you know, we are incredibly wealthy here in Australia. But our material blessing can blind us. Wealth can blind us to the things that are really important. And our wealth can make us self-sufficient and it makes us not depend on God. Let's, so so I'll, here's, here's a key I want you to, to take. Blessing can blind us. Let's say that together. Blessing can blind us. Blessing can blind us. This is a damning indictment of the Laodicean church. It really is. And it's a particular soft spot for those of us in wealthy Western countries like Australia. We're rich. We're fat. We're self-sufficient, and as a result, we get lazy. We don't need Jesus. We can get through our day-to-day life without him. Blessing can blind us. I mean, think about it. In, the, in your life following Jesus, whether it's months or years, 
When are the times that you have needed Jesus the most? When are the times you have felt closest to Jesus? It's when you haven't got it all together. It's when you need something. It's when your marriage is falling apart or it's when your kids are going off the deep end or it's when you can't pay your bills or it's, 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 it's when your health declines. Those are the times when you really jump into prayer. Those are the times when you really feel close to Jesus. When we have everything we need, life's easy. We cruise. Do you know the times when my prayer life takes a dip week to week? It's when I'm not preaching on the weekend. It's true. When I'm preaching on the weekend, it's like, oh, God, I need you. <laughs> but the rest of the time, oh, okay, I can just pull back. Because I'm naturally sinful, you know, I'm naturally selfish. And you're just the same. When we need God, we're close to him. But our blessing, it can blind us to the things that are really true. Luckily, here at Riverland Central, for a long time, we've recognised the danger. We've recognised the danger of, of being blind to our blessing. or well, Our blessing can blind us. And we're actually aware of our responsibility as rich Christians in this world. And every year we meet together for our annual Kingdom Conference where we look at the needs around our world and together we um, ask God to speak to us and we pledge generously as a, as a congregation, as a family, to support all kinds of amazing Christian initiatives around our world. And we do that with our money. Look around this room. It's not a big congregation. Um, but our, our church regularly pledges around $50,000 each year to the work of Christ around the world. That's, that's in addition to our tithes and offerings. And what that does is it just makes sure that we are using our wealth for good. We are using our wealth for the kingdom and not allowing it to blind us to our need for Christ. So this year, I want you to mark this in your diary. Our Kingdom Conference this year is the 26th and the 27th of August. We have a special guest, Pastor Dale Hewitt, from the Dream Builders Network in our, in our movement coming to speak to us at our Kingdom Conference. And that's a really special part of the church where we, we get together and we don't let this thing blind us to what's important. So, we've dealt with, what have we dealt with? Water. We've dealt with wealth. Let's see what's next. Verse 18. Also, buy white garments from me so you'll not be shamed by your nakedness. White garments. That relates to the black wall, doesn't it? Do you remember all the rich people of Laodicea wore expensive black clothes? Well, Jesus is saying, trade in your black clothes for my white clothes. And when Jesus talks about white garments, he's talking about white as the color of purity. Okay? It's, not about, it's not about skin color. It's not about anything like that. This is about the white being the color of something clean and pure and holy. And what's the only way we get to be clean and pure and holy? It's if we put on the clothes that Jesus offers us, the robes of righteousness. You see, when we come before God, God the Father doesn't see my filthy deeds. He sees the righteousness of Jesus that is on me like a garment. Okay? The Bible says that each of our own righteousness is like filthy rags, we're incapable of saving ourselves. We actually all need Jesus. and We all need his white clothes to be able to enter into the presence of God. And then Jesus goes on to say there, ointment for your eyes that you'll be able to see. There's our last key word, health. The city of Laodicea was famous for their eye care, their health care, particularly in the area of their eye care. They sold special ointments that were supposed to clear up eye disease. So Jesus here is telling them, you can't really see what's important. You're spiritually blind. You're relying on this stuff and this stuff. Come to me and I'll make you see what's really important, Jesus is saying. And then he actually, I mean, this is a harsh, harsh word. But he goes on and he graciously tells them, 
why he's hammering them. Why he's hammering them. Verse 19. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. So for those of you who have kids in the room, no, those of you who have kids and you're in the room, when your kids kick up, when they yell at you or when they you know, uh, run away or they break things in your house, what do you do? Do you say, oh, kids are kids? That's okay. Don't worry about that. No, you don't, do you? You discipline them. You say, hang on, we don't do that here. Come on, we need to speak nicely to each other. You take their Xbox away or you turn off the internet or you do something like that. When our kids were little, of course, like every other kid, they'd have tantrums. But they very, very quickly learned that when they had tantrums, all bets were off the table. (coughs) When they had tantrums, we don't negotiate with terrorists. We're not doing that. It doesn't matter what you want. If there's a tantrum, you don't do it. We discipline them. We discipline them. A kid who's tantruming needs to know that you don't get everything you want. Otherwise, they grow up into adults who use a tantrum to get what they want. So disciplining people is a good thing. And disciplining your children is a good thing. And God, of course, is a father, and he disciplines his children who he loves. Let's read on, verse 20. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. So sometimes preachers will bring out this Bible verse as the one, the big one, to kind of help people make a decision to follow Jesus. You might have heard them. They say, you know, Jesus, he's knocking on the door of your heart. You need to let him come in. Say yes to Jesus today. And that's all fine. I I don't have a problem with that. But remember, the original context of this verse, Jesus is speaking to churches. Jesus is speaking to churches. Jesus is knocking on the door of the Laodicean church and he's saying, hey, I'm locked out. Let me in. Let me in. How easy is it for us to sometimes think, oh, we've got it all together. You know, we're chosen by God. We're in the zone. We're part of a great church. I wonder, are there churches where Jesus is knocking on the door and he's saying, actually, you've locked me out of my church. You've locked me out of this this congregation. You've locked me out of this gathering. Jesus is telling the Laodicean church, it's actually not too late. Open the door and let me in. And we'll share a meal as friends. We're going to wind up shortly, but as we do, um, there's a famous 1800s painting, and it's by William Holman Hunt, and it's called The Light of the World. Do people know this painting? Some of you might. Um, I think it's currently in St. Peter's uh, in, in England at the moment, and it's been there for a long time. Now, you can see it there on the screen, some of the detail from it. So Jesus, there's Jesus. He's wearing a crown. Okay, it's, so he's Revelation Jesus. He's not um, Jesus on the earth. He's, 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 he's King Jesus wearing a crown and he's carrying a lantern. And you can see there that he's knocking at an old door. And the door looks like it hasn't been opened for a long time, doesn't it? And it's overgrown with weeds and vines. It's, it's a door that's been disused. Now, any art students in the, in the room? Yep. Now, art students know that you look at a painting and you look for unusual details. What's the unusual detail in this painting? There's no door handle. That's right. There's no doorknob on that door. Uh, it's, it's a door that can only be opened from the inside. It can't be opened from the outside. So Jesus is knocking. But whoever's inside the door has to open the door. He can't be a home invader and head on in. Okay? Jesus can only get in if whoever's inside opens the door. I want to say to you this morning, is Jesus truly the Lord of your life? 
Or is Jesus knocking on the door? You have to let him in. You have to let him in. He won't invade. He won't break down the door. You have to let him in. As the band comes, you might say, well, yes, I've been following Jesus. I've said yes to Jesus. But what are the areas of your life that you haven't let Jesus into? I mean, is it the person that you're dating? If, 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 if God is truly our God, you know, if Jesus is truly our Lord, he gets a say in the person that you, you spend time with, doesn't he? He gets a say in the person that you want to be close to. What about what you watch? Do you, do you let Jesus have a say in what you watch on TV or, or what you listen to? What about what you eat and drink? Does Jesus get a say in those things? What about the way you spend your money? What about who you hang out with? What about what the kind of work you do? You see, Jesus wants to come into every area of our lives, but he wants to be invited. The door's only got one, a knob on one side of it, and he knocks and he waits for us to say, hey, Jesus, come on in. You're, you're welcome here. You're welcome here. We might rely on the things that we can see. We might allow our wealth to blind us to what's really important. We might even be comfortable in the things that we have. But for some of us, are we actually lukewarm? Are we lukewarm in the things of faith? Will you stand with me? I hope you've enjoyed our series on the, the churches of Revelation, the, the seven churches uh, mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. It doesn't end on a high note. You know, the, the Laodicean church probably gets smashed more than any of the others, actually. But I think sometimes we need a good kick in the pants, don't we? If we, if we only come to church for everything that sounds good and kind of pumps us up, what are we doing? So what I want to say this morning, Jesus is knocking on the door. He's knocking on the door of your heart. He's knocking on uh, the door of your life. He's knocking on the door of our church. Let's make sure that we, give, we invite him in. Let's make sure that we give him room. Let's make sure that he is here. So I don't know if... I want to pray for two things this morning. Firstly, I want to pray for people who... You know there's areas of your life where you haven't let Jesus in. You know, you've said yes to Jesus. You might have prayed a sinner's prayer back in 1996. But really, you've just been coasting. You know, really, there are areas in your life that you are not, no, are not consistent with God. Well, Jesus is knocking. Jesus is knocking. And I want to pray for you right now that you'll have the courage and the strength to let him in. And then we're going to pray for anybody in the room who has not said yes to Jesus. You know, he might be knocking on the door of your heart. He might be saying, hey, salvation is here for you. You just need to take it. You just need to take it. Don't wait for, for God to try and overwhelm you with that or whatever. Sooner or later, it's we have to let him in. We have to let him in. So let's pray together. And if this is you in either of these categories, just agree with me as we pray. Just agree with me as we pray. Lord God, right now we're praying for everybody here, Lord, who they might have said yes to you, but they're coasting with you. There's, there's areas of their lives, God, that they haven't submitted to you. It might be who they date. It might be who they, uh, what they watch. 
It might be what they eat and drink. It might be the, the other ways they live their lives. It might be where they put their trust. Right now, for those people, God, I pray for them. We pray for them together. And I pray, Lord, for strength and courage to invite you in to every area of their lives. To every area of their lives. To not be content with, with being lukewarm and having a half-hearted faith. I pray for courage and strength to be complete disciples, hot for you, hot for you, and, and to be chasing after you and your purposes chasing after you and your plans to be able to represent you well Jesus to a broken world around us and now God I pray for anyone in the room who doesn't know you and just right now while we've got every eye closed and every head bowed if you don't know Jesus and you want to say yes to Jesus today just quickly give me a, a wave if that's you this morning if, if you've never said yes to Jesus and you want to say yes to Jesus this morning? You want to invite him in? Is anyone here this morning? I want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Lord, I pray for people in this room, in the overflow room and on the live stream, who don't know you, don't know you Jesus, who haven't opened the door to let you in. Give them the strength and courage to open that door, I pray, and to say yes to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's important that every single one of us says yes to Jesus, whatever that looks like, you know, in every area of our lives. So we're going to spend just a little bit more time singing now, worshipping Jesus. And there's a great line in this song that says, yes, I will. As we sing that this morning, when we sing, yes, I will, as much as you can, just open the door. In whatever area of your life, you need to open the door to Jesus. Say, yes, I will. Yes, I will. Let's worship you. say that now. God's here. Yes, I will lift you high in the Lord's valley. Yes, I will bless your you high in the lowest valley. 
encourage you, let Jesus in to every area of your life. Don't leave him knocking on that door. Don't leave him knocking on that door. We're going to break in just a moment. Um, if you prayed one of those prayers this morning and you really mean it, you, uh, you know that something shifted in you this morning, come and have a talk to me afterwards. I'll be up the front here and we'll have a talk and I'll just help you to kind of reinforce what, whatever God's doing in you this morning. Or if you've come with other needs this morning, whether it's needs around healing, uh, needs around other issues that are going on in your life and you'd love someone to pray with you and pray for you, it's the opportunity to receive prayer here as well. As we break, of course, um, on the screen there'll be our uh, BSB details, our bank details for, for those who want to give into the work of Riverland Central um, and also to give your, your um, missions offerings and things like that. Uh, we also have our giving stations at the back of the room here and, and in the next room if you, if you want to give physically rather than electronically. I want to read from 2 Corinthians 9 where Paul says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having everything you need, you'll abound in every good work. Let's be generous givers to God. Let's, let's sow generously knowing that we reap generously as well. The band's going to play us out. Next door for coffee and cake and other things. Prayer down the front. Please collect your children from our children's program. We don't want them left here all week like happened last week. Only joking. Only joking. God bless you.